Hey, what's up? And welcome to this episode of EST, the podcast for established church leaders by established church leaders. My name is Josh. My name is Sam, and I love all the noises that children bring to the church. Children are great. And the smells. Mm, I, I didn't know that I love the, that, but I, I so, love the noises. On Sunday morning, mm-hmm. I come in, I park in the back lot in the back spaces. Right. And that way, you know, we just, we have parking issues here at West Bradenton, particularly on Sundays that are more highly attended. So I'll park in that back spot in the back Mm -hmm. side of the lot. I walk in, which means I'll walk in through the preschool. And last Mm -hmm. Sunday I walked in and I was like, hmm, it smells like poo. (laughs) And we're trying to figure out why. Why does that spot in the preschool building smell like poo? And we went on a little poo hunt, mm-hmm. and we're still trying to figure out where the poo is. Oh, no, you still didn't find it? <laughs> we think That's it's a, a – actually, I, th- I think it's a sewer trap issue. You know, yeah, it doesn't get used over the weekend. probably what it is. Yeah. yeah. you got to cap that off. Um, yeah, I'm something like you, that. Yeah, you got to find that, man. You got to find – that's that's no bueno. But we're going to be talking about sharing space, particularly with preschool. And so um, that's that's why if you're a listener and you're thinking, why are we talking about poo? That's why. Sharing you know who doesn't smell like poo? Church teams. Church teams does not smell like poo, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, terrible marketing language for them. But that's just where where we went. Um, but yeah, hey, we had we had Boyd on the last episode. Yeah, you should go so... back and listen to that show. It definitely, it was really good on what pastors miss about technology. And mm-hmm. that was, Boyd's been in a role at a church. He started this company with the church in mind, and so he knows this stuff so well. I had a ton of good things to say. So go back and listen to the episode with Boyd Pelly, uh, what pastors miss about technology. But we also want you to go check out the free offer at est.church for church teams and their church management software system. Um, it's really good. So. Uh, ESD.church is where you can go to get it. Uh, Boyd would love to talk to you about what his company can do for your church. So thank you, church teams. Get her done. All, All right. right so. Big picture. Big picture. I'm going to just put you on the spot. Okay. Preschool at a church. Good idea mm-hmm. or not? I think mostly it's a good idea. I think it almost always can be a good idea. Um, we have a preschool. I've I've pastored churches with preschools. I have heard horror stories about it. Um, I've not experienced those myself, not experiencing them now. Um, but I've heard of horror stories, but yeah, they, they, I think they're largely good in theory. You're, you're getting young families into your campus. You're also getting, um, maybe a revenue stream. I've seen churches that exist off of the revenue stream. So that would be on the category of a bad idea. Uh, don't do that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think they're okay. How about you? I agree. I think in most cases, it's a good idea. Yeah. But you need to make sure that you know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and that you stick to a framework and some guidelines, which we're going to talk about here on today's episode. So we have a partnership with a local private school where Mm -hmm. we house their preschool on our church campus throughout the week. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, the teachers, the director, their church, they're members of our church. Um, That's not by design, that's more by happenstance. But the connection between our church and the local private school, which is right down the road, uh, it's pretty strong. Our church, our church has a, you know, very strong presence at their campus in terms of our people being there. So Mm -hmm. it's a natural sort of partnership. And that's one thing that I would say is, you know, for us, that was that was very natural. Um, if you're forcing it, it's probably not a good idea. Like if you feel like, man, I'm just really forcing this relationship. Um, it's probably best that you find another group to partner with if you want, if you want a preschool. Uh, but it's not our preschool. It just yeah. happens to be on our campus and it's a great arrangement. It has worked out really, really well for us because people get used to our campus you know, if they're new to the school and they're looking for a church, often they come by our church. They don't all join, mm-hmm. of course, but a lot of them will get a lot of visitors who are connected to the preschool. Um, yeah. And I love all the noises, man. I love that our facilities yeah. getting used all the time. Uh, it's pretty dead in the summer when, you know, you come in on a Tuesday and uh, 
you know, it's quiet. I don't want the quiet. I want the noise. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. So that reminds me of a couple of things. I've had this idea for a while and it may be going on out there. I've just not seen it. So you've got all these like you, you might be in a region where education is a concern for people, but they don't really have good private school options, that sort of stuff. I've never really understood why two or three, four, whatever, larger churches don't get together, create a board. And instead of one church trying to create some sort of private school um, set up there, why couldn't three churches create a private school and the lower school be at one, the middle school be at another, the high school be at another? And kind of the way that, you know, in public school system, they're not all K through 12 at one campus. They're all spread out. I think that could uh, reduce the burden on one school, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I've, I've been curious about that. But one thing I will say about the idea that you just shared there with it's, I think you hit on something really important there. It's not our preschool. They are partners with us. Most often what I've seen is it works best if you can create some sort of separation between the church and the preschool. So you need the finances to be easily understood by themselves. Um, just look at the, the preschool and understand the finances by itself. The church is financed by themselves. I've seen those to where it is very much that church is preschool, but the preschool is paying in some sort of um, benefit or um, I don't know, some sort of thing where it's along the lines of, um, you know, rent or any, you don't always have to do that. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying that like when the books are clean, it's easier to understand things. Now, that being the case, one thing I would highly, uh, not highly recommend, I'm telling you, you need to do is whatever financial stipulations you have over the pre or over the church, the preschool needs to have those as well. If it's your organization, if it's your church. So if your finance team is looking over your church's finances, the finance team needs to be looking over the preschool's finances as well. I, I've been in a situation where there was a lot of mismanagement of funds and it was being hidden um, within the preschool. Um, and, you know, the director and some of the church staff and things were just not, not being accountable, not using, mismanaging uh, the funds that they should have been overseeing. And the church myself, some of the people on finance team, we all assumed it was being shared as it's supposed to be. So you just want to make sure that they're separate yet equal. That would be kind of how I would say separate, but they fall under the same uh, categories. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I mean, churches get into trouble with preschools really uh, in, in a few areas, financial, um, the financial areas where misappropriation can happen or even outright embezzlement. Mm -hmm. uh, insurance, mm -hmm. you know, who's covered and for what reason and why. Uh, and, and then obviously child safety issues. So there's kind of the three big categories, financial insurance, child safety, that you really need to be concerned about if you go down this road with the, with the preschool. Uh, I'll, I'll go as far as to say in a revenue producing ministry, the ultimate goal needs to be self-sustaining. So mm -hmm. whatever, if you start a, a ministry that that by design has you know a revenue model where you're, you're you're charging people. I do not like the idea of well you know we're just going to fund this you know we're going to provide deep discounts and fund this through through the church. There's times to do that, um, but I would much rather just offer scholarships to people uh, if they are needy, right? Mm -hmm. If they if they are you know uh, people that can't afford it on their own. I don't like the idea of subsidizing. A preschool because that builds in a culture of um, entitlement and long term can be very detrimental to the church, uh, particularly in the situations where the preschool becomes the tail wagging the dog, uh, right. which it needs to be avoided at all costs. As you mentioned earlier, you know, the churches that basically exist and the only way that they're able to exist is through the preschool and the funding of the preschool. Mm -hmm. um, those are those are very uh, unhealthy situations, if not outright dangerous for the church. Because, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're at the point now where, you know, uh, you're completely dependent upon a, a, another ministry and you, you haven't figured it out yourself. 
So yeah. I am a big fan of preschools. I think they work in most cases, but those are some of the dangers of, of having a preschool. Don't let it become the tail wagging the dog. Be very concerned about child safety, know the insurance mm -hmm. stuff. And then if it's going to be revenue producing, it needs to be event. It may not be right first, right? You may start it with the idea of, Hey, we're going to get this thing going. And over five years, it's going to be self-sustaining. Uh, but I would definitely have a plan or a model for, uh, f for the ministry to be self-sustaining. And then potentially, ultimately, you know, the bigger the decision here is, is it a ministry in the church or is it a ministry of the church? And ministry in the church is a different model than ministry of the church, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a ministry of the church, I still think it needs to be self-sustaining, but it does uh, put put a different sort of management perspective on it. If it's just a ministry in the church and they're leasing your space, or in the case of the partnership that we have, it's a dollar a year. You know, we don't really charge them. Um, you, you know, that that has a different way of approaching how you manage it because it's not really yours at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that like some basic questions that people stop asking or they're not really thinking through is if it's a ministry, what would be the expectations of ministries in your church? So if it's the women's ministry or the children's ministry, student ministry, we sort of expect because we are biblical Christians that people are coming to faith in Christ through that ministry, that disciples are being made, that people are plugging into Christian community. We're expecting that those three things, at the very least, are happening. Um, we don't, even though this is a conversation about money, we would like for our members, and we do expect from a personal discipleship level, people to contribute financially, to give sacrificially, because that's what Scripture teaches. However, I'm not running down the hallway of the children's ministry, like asking little one-year-olds, you know, when's the last time you contributed? So there are times where we understand that that's not going to necessarily necessarily generate revenue, but that's fine because we are making disciples. We are introducing people to Christ. So that's one kind of thing. That's a ministry. There are revenue generating streams that are to make money. Okay, that's that's what they do. We have space. There's time in the weekend or throughout the week. We could provide a service to the community. Because of overhead, we could even provide that service for cheaper than competi competitors. So that generates revenue. But so very often in these situations, they're not introducing anybody to Christ. They're not making any disciples and they're not making any money. They're, in fact, draining money off of the church. But because they keep using the term, well, it's a ministry. Well, then if it's a ministry, it's going to have to have you. You would like anything else. Is there somebody on staff or is there some ministry leader approving the curriculum? Is there is the ministry, the staff all being approved through the personnel team of your church if you're congregationally led or the elders if you're elder board? So you've got all of these kind of there's two categories and whichever one you choose is fine. And but make sure that it is being operated in that manner with that mindset because if you if you choose the worst of both sides, then you're going to end up in a problem. So obviously, step back, have the church, the congregation decide which one it is, and then put the best practices around that. That'll help you out with kind of framing out the conversation. Yeah, and to that point, even things such as, uh, you know, team member or staff, in this case staff, discipline. And, mm. you know, we have a teacher who... Uh, got out of line in some sort of way and needs to be disciplined. That teacher is a member of the church. Mm. You know how how do you deal with that? So uh, before you just jump into this and say, "Hey, this is going to bring young families into the church," well, it might. In a lot of cases, it does, and that's a good reason to have a preschool is mm. to introduce mm -hmm. young families to your church. But you need to make sure that you tidy up any potential problems. Um, so I'll add to that whole idea of, you know, child safety, uh, finances and insurance. I'll also add human resources and mm -hmm. how, how do you manage the team of people that are, you know, part of the preschool? Uh, right. you know, we have some very clear guidelines at our, our church for that. We, we don't because it's the school's responsibility to, um, to hire and to fire and to discipline employees. 
Uh, now, if there was a major issue, we would be made aware of it because it, you know, it'd be something that happened on our campus. Um, and for that reason, we could potentially be liable. So, you know, as you look to start a school, make sure you contact your insurance company and you have a pretty clear idea of where your liability is with that. Even if you're in a partnership scenario, if something happens on your campus, you're probably going to get sued. If, if someone wants to sue, they're not just going to yeah. sue the school. They're going to sue the church as well. Now, I, th that's pretty rare. I want to be upfront. You know, doesn't that should not prevent you from, you know, the fear of a lawsuit should not prevent you from doing ministry, any kind of ministry, preschool included. Um, but that contingency plan and, and that, uh, you know, just that quick, you know, idea of what would we do if, uh, that does need to be addressed. If you have a school and you haven't addressed it, it needs to be addressed. And if you're thinking to start a school, I think that it's it needs to be part of the process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some other things that I've learned through the years of dealing with things like this. Um, there are different kinds of what you and I are calling school. Uh, there are different kinds of like preschool, daycare, child care. Mother's Day um, out. Mother's Day out. So if it's a two day a week program or maybe a three day a week program, that's not the it could have some school elements to it. They could be learning and things like that. But that's reaching and ministering to a different demographic. So um, if you're in a very affluent area or an area that has excess uh, sort of income, then maybe a two or three day a week program is it's, it's, it's pretty good and it can serve as an outreach situation. If you're not in that situation, or even if you are in those uh, fluent areas with double income homes, people are going to need, or what they're really looking for is more like all day, um, five days a week. And they're wanting a very early drop off and a later pickup because what you're, you're helping there is the parent um, who needs to drop off the child and then go to work and then have the child cared for the whole day and then pick up the child after work. So you got commute times in there. So those are things to think about because if you're trying, if all you're offering is that two day a week boutique -y opportunity for a single income families, uh, you know, stay at home parent to drop off the kids, they get some social interaction, they can go run errands, but you're in a community that doesn't support that demographically then you may get frustrated with it. And you could also see yourself as like, whether or not this is going to generate revenue or whether or not it's going to be a ministry. That five day a week, early drop off late, that can be very ministry driven. You're actually reaching and supplying a need at a lower cost. Whereas the boutique today, that's not necessarily a need in anybody's life. And I understand there may be some parents that would fight me over that, but uh, it's it's just not. So, um, but it's fine. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying understand what you're providing and who exactly you're providing that for. Very often, pastors went to seminary. There's no class on preschool management in seminary. So, uh just not knowing the categories. Is this a ministry in or of the church? Is this revenue generating? Is this boutique? Is this a daycare? Those things will have very different ramifications. And to your point, Sam, when it comes to things like uh, safety and security, depending on how many days and hours you are offering this, your state may want to be involved with what's happening. And so there are th certain thresholds, numbers of students, how many hours are there, et cetera, that you want to be aware of before you run out and start this five-day-a-week thing that you haven't talked to your state about. Um, your state's probably going to be very interested in what you're doing there with child care. They will definitely be interested if you don't go through the proper licensing uh, yep. arrangements. Uh, great, great advice there. I will add the lead pastor needs to determine his level of involvement as well. Mm. Um, I am there as a support and encouragement and just really high level stuff. Um, you know, relational interacting with teachers, uh, or in the case of something negative, Hey, you know, child was injured or something happened. Sam, you need to know about this. Mm. Um, 
so I have, though I am present a lot around the preschool, my managerial responsibilities are almost none. Only mm -hmm. the big decisions come to me. Uh, yeah. I am certainly not involved in hiring, firing, any of that stuff. Just really big picture, really big picture items. I like it that way. And I would encourage you if you're a lead pastor to find a director that can manage all of the ticky tack stuff. When I first got started as a pastor, I can't tell you how many conversations I got pulled into about where are my markers? You know, hmm. like the Sunday school class that's in here seems to have taken my markers. Where are they? You know mm. what? I, I, I don't care. I was about to say I care, but I don't. <laughs> I really don't care. I don't know, and I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> um, I, I should be more diplomatic and, you know, mm. uh, gracious uh, and, and concerned uh, as a pastor, but that's just better left to a director who can probably do a much, no, who will do a much better job than I will in terms of caring about where the markers are. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And you bring up a great point, finding a director, and I already said there's no preschool class at seminary. It's not a preschool, running a preschool or a daycare or whatever it is you're going to run. These are not just little things that you just do on the side. They're When they're well ran, they're ran with a certain skill set and a certain knowledge base. And so um, if you're just because you're the pastor of the church or maybe the children's pastor, that doesn't mean that they have that skill set, knowledge, interest in doing that. And very often I see some of these responsibilities with these schools just being shifted over uh, to ministerial staff and ministerial staff are not always this. What, what I'm trying to say is what often makes you very successful at ministry is not the same skill set that will make you successful at running an organization like a daycare or a preschool. It could be, and there is overlap, but it's not always the same bag of tricks. So you're going to want to make sure that the people in place are doing that. Um, as far as my involvement, I like when the kids come over. I like to be invited over to do things. One of my favorite things uh, that's happened at different preschools, and this is now my third one to be involved in things like this, is every year around Christmas time, the gingerbread man, or not Christmas time, but towards the end of that season, the gingerbread man escapes the kitchen and he runs all over our church. He'll leave little gingerbread clues everywhere. Um, so I love when the kids come in, they're looking for the gingerbread man. I have a clue that I read to the kids. They get very excited. It's very dramatic. And he'll run out my back door. I go way into it. I go get, I go get gingerbread cookies and sprinkle crumbs all throughout and back my door and hide evidence and stuff like that. So, um, I love, uh, interacting with the kids, um, in previously scheduled meetings. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good ministry. You might be a good uh, influence on those kids one day. I just got an image of my mind of all these kids at your church just mm -hmm. devouring the gingerbread man like a pride of lions devours like a gazelle. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Crumbs are flying everywhere. No, yeah. no, they, they made their gingerbreads, and then they ran out of the oven, and you have to go find these cookies, and so you can take them home to your mom. So that's so what you person you personify the cookies that they create, and then you tell your children to eat them. Well, go take them home and share them with your families. But yeah, mm. that's what we do with gingerbread cookies. I actually really like gingerbread cookies; they're oh, one of my man. favorites. I don't want to eat it all the time, but seasonally, yeah, that's that. It just feels right, right? So, yeah. Um, so, bottom line is, I think preschools, in a broad sense. I think they can be very good, very good ministries. I think that most often it's not an issue of whether or not a church should have a preschool. It's like anything else. The church should run and do its business well. Uh, and if you're not, you're going to get in trouble. And just the sad reality is so very many churches are running preschools poorly. And mm -hmm. so they give it a bad rap. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, we certainly want to thank our sponsor, Church Teams. Uh, again, check out the last episode uh, with Boyd Pelly. 
It was really, really good. Uh, and go to esd.church to get that free offer from them for a trial run of their software. Um, as Boyd mentioned in the last episode, the software is, it, it helps you be relational as a pastor. And it, it, it equips you to know what's going on in the life of your people. And if you're like, what does that mean exactly? Hey, just go listen. Boyd well, we gave a pretty in-depth explanation about how, how that can happen. So uh, go to est.church, go ahead and click that tab, fill out the form, and, uh, and then go back and listen to the next episode. Yep. Thank you for listening to our show. We hope that it was enjoyable and informative to you. Let somebody else know about EST, and we'll catch you next week. Uh-huh.